Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, recently I checked out the Ryzen 7 5700G, which is currently only available in OEM systems prior to its retail release next month. So in order to get one early for testing, we had to purchase an HP system and then had that shipped to Australia. So if you haven't watched our review, then I suggest go checking that out first, as today's video is a follow-up that looks more closely at memory performance. A few Harbour Unbox members requested a memory scaling video, and I felt this tied in pretty well with one of the biggest criticisms we saw from that review. It seems a few viewers were upset by our choice in memory, claiming that we were leaving a lot of iGPU performance on the table, and some even went as far as to say we were deliberately gimping performance. And this was despite us meeting the AMD specification by using DDR4 3200. In fact, the DDR4 3200 memory that was used generally outperforms less premium DDR4 3600 and 3800 kits as its low latency CL14 Samsung B die memory, which starts at around $130 US for a 16 gigabyte kit. And that's quite a premium given that DDR4 3200 CL16 memory generally starts around $70 US. So we're talking about almost twice the price. Not only that, but we're using two kits which sees the memory operate in a dual ranked configuration. And this is not to be confused with dual channel memory. And if you want to learn more about this, I do have a video specifically covering this topic and I'll link that in the video description. But the point is, we're using pretty expensive, high quality DDR4 memory already. So how much more performance are we really leaving on the table? Well, today we're going to find out as I'm retesting the iGPU performance of the 5700G using a range of memory configurations. But before we get into the data, it is worth noting that we typically review CPUs using DDR4 3200CL14 memory as it's proven to be a pretty reliable indicator of sweet spot memory performance, closely matching the performance of lower latency, more affordable DDR4 3600 and 3800 memory. Moreover, most of these current generation CPUs officially support DDR4 3200, and there's no guarantee what kind of memory frequencies the IMC will support beyond the official spec. So for example, showing DDR4 4000 performance by default could end up being very misleading if only half the chips in circulation are capable of operating at that frequency. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the testing. For this comparison, I am going to include the GeForce GTX 1063 GB as a reference, simply because it can be purchased secondhand along with a brand new Core i5-10400F processor for about the same price as the Ryzen 7 5700G. Now, normally we don't compare new and used hardware this way, but we're living in quite strange times now, and it really only makes sense to buy secondhand for lower tier GPUs. That said, if it were more normal times, I feel things would be even rougher for the 5700G, as we could use an 8GB RX 580, as these were selling for an $150 US back in early 2020. Now, for the memory, I've tested half a dozen different kits. Some are single rank, while others are dual rank, and that information is listed on the graph, along with the primary timings. Finally, all were configured to run at the 1 to 1 ratio with the Infinity Fabric. I also messed around with the memory allocation for the iGPU, often referred to in the BIOS as the UMA buffer size, and found as was the case with the 2400G and 3400G, it made no difference to performance even when allocating 8 gigabytes. Okay, let's get into the blue bar graphs. Starting with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, we see that the review configuration allowed for 33 FPS on average, and it turns out that's a pretty good result for the 5700G. The best result I was able to produce using higher frequency memory was 36 FPS, so a 9% improvement over the review configuration, and it was achieved using G-Skills DDR4 4000 CL16 memory using a dual rank configuration. Though be aware it does cost $220 US for a 32 gigabyte kit. I also have a DDR4 4400 CL16 kit from G-Skill, which uses the same primary timings, but it's single ranked and despite clocking 200 megahertz higher, it was actually slower for this test, offering just a single frame over the review kit for a mere 3% performance uplift. And this memory costs $150 US for a 16 gigabyte kit. That said, you can buy 16 gigabytes of DDR4 4400 from G School for just $125 US when buying from their Rip Jaws V series. That kit uses looser CL18 timings. And as you can see here, iGPU performance matched that of our low latency DDR4 3200 review kit with just 33 FPS on average. So simply throwing high frequency memory at the Ryzen 7 5700G won't solve the problem. Timings are important as well, as is the memory rank. 
I also tried a DDR4 3800 Dual Rank CL18 kit and found performance was on par with the review kit. Then using single rank DDR4 3800, that dropped performance slightly, while CL18 DDR4 3200 single rank was slower again. Though we're only talking about a 6% decrease from the review configuration. Then running really cheap under spec DDR4 3000 memory dropped performance by 9% when compared to our review configuration. So it does appear as though the review configuration is a pretty good guide, delivering comparable performance to reasonably affordable DDR4 3800 memory. But let's move on and check out a few more games. Horizon Zero Dawn is certainly more favourable towards the higher clocked memory kits, showing a 15% performance improvement with DDR4 4000 and 4400 configurations, all of which appeared to max out the integrated Vega graphics at 31 FPS. But again, the review configuration does do a good job of mimicking the kind of performance you'll receive from affordable DDR4 3800 kits, as we're looking at just an extra frame here, or a 4% increase. The margins between the majority of memory kits are much smaller when testing with Watch Dogs Legion. Again, the review configuration basically matched the DDR4 3800 kits with no more than 1 FPS in it, which amounts to a 4% variation. Meanwhile, the single ranked DDR4 4400 kit was up to 7% faster, so a pretty small gain there for what really is quite expensive memory. Then at the top of the graph, we have the very expensive DDR4 4000 kit, which did offer a 14% increase over the review kit, so a decent performance gain there, but we're still only talking about 32 FPS at 1080p using the lowest possible quality settings. Testing with F1 2020 shows up to a 14% performance increase using DDR4 4400 CL16 memory, which allowed for 67 FPS on average, though only a very small improvement in 1% low performance over the review configuration. Then we're only looking at an 8% improvement with the expensive DDR4 4000 memory, while the 3800 kits were again comparable to the review configuration. Then for those of you using cheaper DDR4 3200 memory, you can expect around a 7% reduction in performance compared to what I showed in my review. Then finally, we have Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege, which was one of the few games tested that ran really well on the 5700G at 1080p, and we got away with using the medium quality settings. The review kit allowed for 65 FPS on average, and again, that saw it match the higher clocked DDR4 3800 memory. At best, I was able to boost performance by a further 11% when using the more expensive DDR4 4000 memory, while the 4400 kits were at best 8% faster, so pretty mild gains there. So, as you'd probably expect, faster memory does help improve performance, though it might not be to the degree that you'd hoped. But given what we just saw, I do feel even more confident about our choice in memory to test the Ryzen 7 5700G, which is fortunate as it was kind of set in stone quite some time ago. The premium DDR4 3200 memory that we used is certainly comparable to CL18 DDR4 3800, and we found in the past that the same is also true for CL16 3600 memory. It's also not unrealistic in the sense that it's too good, as the cheap 3200 kit was typically only 4-6% slower. Using the expensive DDR4 4000 memory, we did show that you can often improve the performance of the iGPU by around 15%, which is a nice performance uplift, though you will be paying significantly more than 15% for the faster memory. That said, you can tune cheaper memory, which does help improve performance, but it can be a complex process and achieving stability can be a real challenge, which is why most people just leave memory timings alone. It's also well worth noting that for those of you looking at using the 5700G for gaming and aren't constrained to a tiny mini PC, pairing the APU with premium memory just doesn't make sense. This is because the GTX 1060 will deliver the exact same performance shown in this video using DDR4 2666 memory as it's in no way CPU limited and doesn't require system memory to function. Well, that is assuming that you don't flood the 3GB VRAM buffer, and you likely won't at 1080p using low quality settings, at least in most games. So again, if you're just gaming and not trying to justify buying something like an ASRock DES Mini, you're far better off ignoring the Ryzen 7 5700G and instead snapping up a Core i5-10400 and pairing it with a cheap secondhand graphics card, something like the 3GB GTX 1060 for example, as that will net you over 100% more performance. But if you're hell-bent on purchasing the Ryzen 7 5700G when it hits shelves next month, my advice is to buy some affordable DDR4 3600 or 3800 memory. 
whatever the sweet spot happens to be in your region. And that is going to do it for my 5700G memory scaling guide. If you liked the video, uh, you know what to do. You can also subscribe for more content. We will be looking, I guess, officially at the 5600G and 5700G early next month when you know we can post those reviews and when samples are provided by AMD. So there'll be more APU content coming in the near future. So yeah, if you wanna see that, make sure you are subscribed. Also, you can join the Harbor and Box community over at Floatplane or Patreon. You will get access to our uh, live stream that Tim and myself do. That's actually coming up, I think next week or later this week, depending on when this video goes soon. That's coming up soon. Uh, we also have Q and A stuff behind the scenes, uh, content and a really awesome uh, Discord server for Harbor and Box community members. Also right now we do have a second run of the Harbor Unavailable merch because it was very popular. So we are doing a second run. So if you want that, make sure you get it because not sure there'll be a third run. Wasn't sure there'd be a second, but who knows. Anyway, that is gonna do it for this video. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. And I'll see you again next time.